This is the Floridaville. Get to know the people behind the Florida names you know. I'm your host, Rosanna Catalano. On today's episode, we get to know Representative Alex Andrade. Representative Andrade is an attorney from the Panhandle of Florida, where he was elected to office in 2018. He now serves on several committees in the Florida legislature and will participate in his second legislative session as an elected official. We're in Florida's capital city, and our guest today is Representative Alex Andrade. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You were first elected to the State House of Representatives in 2018. Tell us who you represent. I represent the district, uh, House District 2. Uh, it's the westernmost district. It borders Alabama. It covers uh, South Escambia County, Pensacola, Gulf Breeze, and the entire of uh, Pensacola and Perdido Key. Why did you decide to run for office? I filed for office uh, about a month after Frank White, uh, who was my predecessor, uh, decided to run for attorney general. Uh, and I just, uh, you know, I'm a kind of a romantic about uh, why you should run. And I just, you know, I looked around the district uh, and I thought I was the best for the job. Why do you think people should run? It really, it comes down to if you look around at your friends and family in your community and you feel that you're the best for the job, uh, you kind of have a responsibility to run. And I didn't come up with that. Uh, my buddy, Anthony Sabatini, is a freshman as well. When we were talking to a group of college students some, in, in, in an internship program here last session, you know, I, I kind of encourage people to go be value add in their communities. I don't tell them to run for office. I tell them never to think about running for office because I never thought about running for office. Uh, but Anthony came from a different perspective. And it was, if you know you're the best for the job, you have a responsibility to run if you actually care about your community. I'm sure you received a lot of advice once you decided to run for elected office. What was the best piece of advice you received? Oh, man, that's a very good question. Uh, I would say probably the best piece of advice uh, about running for office, uh, especially at you know the smaller level, like you're at the state representative level, is your election comes down to dollars and doors. You have to believe in yourself enough to actually pull out your cell phone and go through your phone book and make an ask of every single person, even if you haven't spoken to them in you know two or three years. You have to believe in yourself enough to be willing to hear no a lot, uh, to, to raise the money necessary, especially in your first race if you're an unknown candidate like me. You just gotta, you gotta actually fervently believe that you know, you're doing this for the right reasons and enough people are gonna you know, support you and believe in you to, to help you get there. Did you have to give yourself a lot of pep talks? No, I wouldn't say pep talks. There's a lot of anxiety. Uh, it's, but again, I mean, people think that, that all campaigns are funded by big government or, I mean, big, big businesses or interest groups. Your first campaign, your very first campaign, whatever you're doing, it's really your friends and family. So there was more, probably just more anxiety in the fact that, you know, my little brother's a police officer up in Michigan. Uh, they don't pay police officers very well, but he sent me the max contribution for at the state level, which is a thousand bucks. And so when you get, when you have pe close people who, you know, show you that they believe in you, there, there's some anxiety that goes along with it and you feel very responsible to do a good job uh, because of it. Being an elected official is a full-time job and can consume your life and the lives of those closest to you. How did you come to the decision that the time was right for you to throw your hat in the ring? It's funny that you call it a full-time position because it's supposed to not be, and I do have a full-time job. I'm a practicing attorney, but you know, you got to go back to your family. Uh, right now, it's just me, my wife, and our dog, Dash. You go back, you talk to your family, you make sure that everyone's committed and kind of understands what it's going to take, you know, to serve and to, to actually go through the process of an election. And uh, as long as your your wife, your kids, uh, whoever, you know, you go home to every night are okay with it or willing to, you know, put up with it, that, that's, a, that's really the first test. Describe the moment on the campaign trail when you thought, holy cow, I'm really doing this. I could win this. So I had a, a unique race. First, so Northwest Florida only has seven state representatives west of Tallahassee out of 120. So we're severely outnumbered. To be effective as a member of such a small delegation, you have to be a really good team player. And you kind of have to put, you know, you, you, you can't make be a burden on other people. So I got in and 
I worked very hard. I took a lot of people who were talking about running for office to coffee. I said, this is my plan. This is what I want to do. If you want to run against me, you know, go with God. You know, I won't be hurt or offended, but I'd rather have you on my team. And my whole campaign strategy, aside from raising as much money as possible, was to just go get the support of people who at one point might have thought about running against me or opposing me somehow. And I was lucky enough that the vast majority of people I took to coffee didn't run against me. Uh, they ended up supporting me after after that coffee. I didn't have an opponent until two days before qualifying in June, and the election was in August. Uh, so my election was a little bit different in that capacity. So for the majority of the time I was running from October of 2017 until June of 2018, I didn't have an opponent. So everybody just kind of figured I was the de facto nominee. For our listeners that have never come to Tallahassee and participated in a legislative session, can you describe what it is like to come to Tallahassee as a legislator for the first time? Yeah. One, it's it's kind of to be on the floor for the first time, to have your, your name played on a desk on the floor. It's kind of surreal. I would say it's still a little surreal to come to Tallahassee, you know, drive. So it's a four hour drive with the time change to Tallahassee. It's a two hour drive back home to Pensacola with the time change to go down I-10 to kind of have to, you know, put off the real world stuff that you're leaving behind in Pensacola and, and kind of put on the role of a state representative. It is surreal. You know, you, you get to play a small role in a very significant process. You know, and you think about all the people that came before you and all the significant things that they've done. The day to day can sometimes be a little mundane. Meetings can sometimes uh, feel purposeless. You spend a lot of time sitting and waiting, but it's fast paced and then it, it's dead silent. And then it's the, it's the process of, you know, as conservative legislators, we're not in the business of making new law necessarily. We try not to be. But I mean, the, the process of running the 14th largest per by GDP, the 14th largest economy uh, in the world is it's incredible. It's yeah. I mean, I, I still sometimes just can't understand why anybody you know would allow me to be able to play, play such a cool role in this process. Sometimes companies have an onboarding process for new employees. Was there any kind of training for you as a new legislator? House majority and uh, House administration might be a little myth when I say this, but for legislators themselves, no, not really. Uh, there, there is some onboarding for staff, and that's critical. You know, a lot of staff members, because staff, you know, you're as a, a state representative, you get the standard one legislative aide, one district secretary. Your legislative aide travels with you to Tallahassee and works with you in Tallahassee, and your district secretary usually stays home and is the main point of contact for constituent issues and local government and local groups. There's great training and support for staff, but as, as legislators, you know, your, your job role and your, you know, your responsibilities is kind of dictated by your voters back home. So there's, there's somewhat of a trust that you come over here knowing what the job entails, I guess. And there's somewhat of a, a deference in the fact that each legislator has a different style. I mean, I would say my, my daily activity differs greatly to, to some other members because some other members don't see their role the same way that I see my role. You are on a number of committees, Commerce, Government Operations and Technology Appropriations Subcommittee, Health Market Reform Subcommittee, Criminal Justice Subcommittee, and Oversight, Transparency and Public Management Subcommittee. Can you explain to our listeners how committee assignments are made? That's a great question. I'd like to actually ask people in leadership how committee assignments are made sometimes too. So my first my first session, I was on five committees. Uh, I kept three of those going to this session. I asked on to health market reform, and I asked on to criminal justice. It's really dictated by leadership, you know, the speaker's office and and who he de- designates as his deputies. Uh, they make the determination, and you're just kind of grateful for whatever they give you. I mean, the committees that I have are incredible. I'm very fortunate to be in the silos that I'm in. Because committees are broken down by silo. You know, you have the Commerce Committee, and then I believe you have five subcommittees under it. And those five subcommittees are just more specific versions of what commerce is. And then they all kind of, when you have a bill that's referred to committees, if it's a commerce related bill, it'll start in at least one or two of those subcommittees before it goes to the big Commerce Committee, before it's ready to get heard on the floor. What experience in your life best helped you prepare for your life as an elected official? So that it's it's a very good question because you know there there's the technical preparation right. So I w- was fortunate enough to do a fellowship in Governor Scott's office called the Gubernatorial Fellowship. Um, the program is modeled after the White House Fellowship. It brings grad students from around the state to Tallahassee. I was a law student in my third year at UF at the time. 
uh, it pays for that year of school. So I got to go and be a, what's called a visiting student at FSU. Uh, and then you work full time in a state agency. So I got to go work for Anant Prasad over at the Department of Transportation uh, in the executive office at DOT. And I just got this massive wealth of experience at, I think I was 23, 24 years old, you know, navigating the legislative process uh, from the executive side and learning how state agencies run. So that definitely prepared me for the deep, in-depth civic side of it. I would say you, you also have the emotional component to it. And growing up, I had a lot of humbling opportunities uh, and a lot of opportunities to, to always be reminded that I'm very lucky and very blessed. Uh, so always remembering where you came from and always just remembering to be grateful is probably just as important as the, the civic side of understanding what the actual process is. Now take us back, way back, and tell us where you were born and raised and what your home life was like growing up. I was born in the Cayman Islands. Uh, my dad is Jamaican, mom's from Alabama. Uh, so after they met and got married, instead of moving back to Jamaica, they moved to the Cayman Islands, uh, which is where my older brother Colin and I were both born. My dad had a business in the Cayman Islands that manufactured hurricane shutters and aluminum railing. Uh, but if you're not a citizen of the island, you can't own your own business. So he was, I guess, a little frustrated, you know, owning 49% of a company that he built from the ground up. And we moved to South Florida when I was very young. Hurricane Andrew happened, uh, I think, uh, maybe a year after we moved there. And all the, the, the codes changed. And so hurricane shutters became a lot more necessary. Insurance companies started requiring hurricane shutters on new construction. So we grew up understanding how lucky we were, one, to live in the United States, a place that would allow my dad to own his own business, you know, two, to live in the state of Florida, which had this incredible economy. And, you know, we just were always raised being reminded how lucky we were to, to live here and be here. I'm the middle son of three. Uh, my little brother, Barry, was born in Coral Springs. Uh, we lived in Coral Springs growing up. But, you know, we were all, you know, focused on sports and, you know, kind of just the what you'd imagine three boys would be interested in and doing. And uh, my older brother is now a pastor. My little brother is now, like I said, a police officer up in Michigan. And then my mom's a teacher. She's a public school teacher. Uh, she teaches math down at Deerfield Beach High School. That is my alma mater. Deerfield Beach? <laughs> Deerfield Beach High School. Really? Go <laughs> yes. Buck. Go Bucks. How would you describe yourself as a child? So when I was born in the Cayman Islands, I... Um, I was born four weeks early, and uh, the Cayman Islands at the time didn't have maybe the best medical staff or technology. Uh, so uh, my mom's water broke actually a week before I was born. And because they didn't have the capability to, to give birth, I, I guess, or induce birth at five weeks, they, they waited a week. And because of that, I suffered a lot of trauma. You can develop cerebral palsy if you suffer trauma at birth. You know, I was uh, lucky and very, very fortunate, very blessed that uh, when I was born, uh, I was, I was, I mean, I was bruised. I'd obviously suffered trauma. Uh, I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at a very young age, but I was very fortunate in the fact that it was a mild case. You know, I got a, a lot of physical therapy growing up, you know, and, and because of that physical therapy, because of, you know, the attention, because I had, you know, two parents who both, you know, cared about me very much. You know, I was able to have a very normal childhood focused on, you know, playing football, playing soccer. I would say that, you know, school came pretty easy, but that also means sometimes you can be a little intellectually lazy. You know, I'm, I'm probably always going to be a little self-conscious about my work ethic. You know, I tend to overcorrect probably because of it. But yeah, I mean... I loved reading books. I loved learning. Um, you know, I loved the, you know, debating. Uh, I was a Presbyterian Protestant kid going to a Catholic high school. Uh, so if you asked my theology teachers in high school what I was like, they'd probably say I was a little combative. But yeah, I mean, I just, uh, you know, sweet, nice guy. Never really got in any fights or anything. And, you know, I just always kind of wanted to make everybody happy. I'm not sure I should admit, admit this. But in preparing for your visit today, I stalked you a bit online. I noticed many photos of your wife and your dog. Tell us a little about them. So going back to when you have the conversation with your family before you decide to run for office, uh, sometimes they'll give you conditions. And the one main condition uh, of running for office was if I won the election, if we won the election, my wife was going to get a dog. So uh, she decided to get a mini golden doodle. Uh, and we called him, well, she got, she obviously got to give him his first name, Dash, but I was actually talking with 
a, a friend of mine, another state representative named Josie Tomko, because Jessica, my wife, said that, you know, magnanimously said I could give him a middle name. Uh, and I'm a, a big, big Little Wayne fan. I'm a big rap fan. So we named him Dash Young Money Andrade because Young Money is the label that Lil Wayne started uh, <laughs> after leaving Cash Money uh, when he was when he was uh, uh, coming up as a rapper. But I love everything about that story. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I got to give credit to Josie. Um, but no, Dash is Dash is a year old now. Uh, he's you know got a lot of energy. Uh, he's a very affectionate dog. You know, we got him the same month I started coming over to Tallahassee. So for the first four months he was living with us, I was almost never home. You know, I was traveling or working or something. And uh, so it took him a little bit longer to warm up to me than it did to Jessica. Uh, and he is not supposed to sleep in our bed. But, uh, you know, we I mean, we, we crate trained him in preparation so he wouldn't sleep in our bed. But I came home after those four months and he'd taken my spot in bed. Um, no, he's, he's a very affectionate and sweet dog. And we're actually going to get a second dog, I've been told, in June of next year. And I've been told it's going to be a, a, it's called a schnoodle. It's a schnauzer poodle. Uh, so it'll be a little bit smaller than Dash. She's about 30 pounds. How did you meet your wife, Jessica? We met fall freshman year at the University of Florida. Uh, so I was in a fraternity at the time and she was in a sorority. And uh, if you're familiar with how fraternities and sororities are, you'll have the popular sororities and the not so popular sororities and the popular fraternities and not so popular fraternities. I would say my fraternity was one of the uh, not so popular fraternities and my wife Jessica's was definitely one of the more popular sororities. But you, there's a, a freshman charity event where you get randomly paired fraternities and sororities called New Member Lip Sync and they paired our two organizations together. And so we were dance partners in a dance competition fall freshman year at UF and we've been uh, dating ever since. What was your major at the University of Florida? I majored in advertising. I'd say for for both Jessica and I, we're, our focus was more involvement. You know, we we took care of school. We were always you know good students, but the University of Florida, in, in our experience, was just such a great breeding ground for leadership and experiences. You know, I was a board member for a charity called uh, Dance Marathon at UF, which raises millions of dollars for Chan's Children's Hospital there. You know, Jessica was trusted with a one and a half million dollar budget or, or something like that to, to run UF's homecoming. Uh, we were both in, involved. Well, Jessica was involved in student government. I was more involved in the charity and I was also a cheerleader at UF. So yeah, I mean, our while your major is important for learning in, in college, uh, the experiences you get when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, if you're seeking them out, you'll you'll be entrusted with, you know, a lot of responsibility if you go seek it out. And so I would say our real major was just involvement at UF. I know you are an attorney and you attended the University of Florida's law school. Why did you choose to go to law school? So I can give you, you know, the kind of the political answer, or the honest answer. And uh, I'm going to probably just give you the honest answer because I never wanted to go to college. You know, I wanted to go enlist in the, the army or go be a missionary. My parents, my dad especially. So I'm I'm very white. So when you hear that I'm Jamaican, a lot of people comment on the fact that I don't look Jamaican and I, and I don't. But Jamaica has not ever really been a it's not as you would imagine, a racial system being like the South is, you know, historically, it's always been more focused on class. And because of that, uh, Jamaicans really do put a high emphasis on education. And uh, I didn't realize how important that was until I told my parents junior year of high school that I didn't want to go to college. And, you know, my dad sat me down and was like, this is uh, more important than you think. And if you don't do this, we'll definitely be disappointed and we might disown you. So I um, went to college. And I went to the University of Florida because Bright Futures and Florida Prepaid, you know, allowed me to go there for free. I wasn't convinced I wanted to go in a higher ed at all. And then I met Jessica, who's very ambitious and very focused. And uh, and she's known she wanted to go to law school since forever. And uh, so the real answer about why I went to law school, at least initially, was I, I figured I couldn't make less money than my wife. So we both went to law school, you know, but we, we both, you know, really took to it. What extracurricular activities did you participate in while in law school? I was on the trial team, and then I was the uh, chief justice of the UF Student Government Supreme Court. Explain to us what that is. So, so student government, uh, especially at a large university like UF, uh, involves you know student senate, which a lot of people are probably familiar with. You know, at UF at the time, the student senate I think controlled a fifteen to twenty million dollar student activity and service fee budget. So they collected these taxes really from students and they distributed the money. Then you have the executive side, student body president, vice president down the line, uh, and then you have to have the organs at the judiciary to kind of interpret the rules of the student government uh, and help navigate you know elections violations and rules violations for 
anything that the other two branches are doing. So it's it's just a mini uh, a mini version of an actual government. What was your first job out of law school? My first job out of law school was at uh, Moorhill Westmoreland, where I still am today. We're a small uh, civil defense firm over in Pensacola. On this show, we like to discuss the entrepreneurial spirit, which is an attitude and approach to thinking that actively seeks out change rather than waiting to adapt to change. It's a mindset that embraces critical questioning, innovation, service, and continuous improvement. Tell us in what ways, if any, these qualities have shaped your career or your life. Well, I mean, there, there, there's there's two, I guess, entrepreneurial experience I've had in the past few years. Uh, I would say that one, running for office for the first time is very entrepreneurial. You're taking a huge risk. You're taking a huge time risk, a huge financial risk, and you're you're taking the chance that you're going to win and, and it's going to pan out for you. So, you know, having the the backdrop of UF, understanding how to be humble and work within a process, definitely helped in that capacity. But the other one is, uh, you know, going back to what I normally tell people is, especially young people who are in college and want to get involved in some kind of a leadership role. Wherever you move after college, just go focus on the community, find niches to fill uh, and opportunities to be of service without asking for respect or a leadership role. And my wife and I and a friend of ours named Walker Wilson started a charity in Pensacola a few years back called On Bikes. And what we do is we buy bikes wholesale uh, from a, a large bike manufacturer. And then we have this massive event where we have people come and help us assemble these bikes that come unassembled. And then we give them to the charities in town uh, that serve kids throughout the year. You know, like our local foster care program, Families First Foster Care, Guardian Lightham, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club. And so this Christmas will actually be giving out, I think, about 600 bikes. I just placed the bike order uh, this week. Wow. And that's entrepreneurial as well. You know, you're starting up a business. You have to go through the 501c3 process to get your tax exemption. And then you have to go again and you have to go put your, you know, believe in your organization enough to go ask people for money. Uh, and, you know, we've done a very good job of it. And then aside from the, the bike build itself and then giving these bikes to the charities who then distribute it to the kids, we don't give directly to kids. We want to give the, the charities in town that do so much more for children in the community the opportunity to have that win at Christmas. You know, we have a, a big thank you event for our sponsors where we shut down the streets in Pensacola and we have a big slow ride uh, bike event where, you know, 300, 400 people come on their bikes and we just have this big old party and people, you know, ride through this beautiful Pensacola. Is, if you've never been to Pensacola, it's a beautiful downtown. It's right on the water. It's got a ton of history and character. And you get to go ride around, you know, with the, the streets closed for an hour, like an open park, and then come back to home base and have a big, you know, band and some beer if you're of age and, you know, hang out and celebrate. That sounds amazing. Getting back to your current work at the legislature, what do you hope to accomplish for the constituents in your district? So one thing that people might not realize about being a legislator is you get to do constituent service year round. Uh, the Florida legislature is part time as far as session goes, you know, sessions, 60 days, two months, and then you have committee weeks prior. I get to go help constituents every time they call my office. And half my job is making sure that people know to call my office. Uh, and then, you know, a constituent will call us, say they have an issue with DBPR, the Department of Business and Professional Re Regulation, with their license or something. And we'll go work it up with them and help them navigate the process of getting their issue resolved with a state agency. So, I mean, we do that all the time. And I, and I, that's probably one of my favorite parts of the job uh, because you get to go provide actual direct benefit to a constituent. Uh, on a more, much more personal level. Uh, the other component, obviously, is passing a budget, which is our one constitutional requirement as legislators, and passing you know, laws or changing laws uh, as you see fit. Last year I got to, uh, I was fortunate enough to be allowed to run the bill uh, that provide, provides death benefits for men and women in uniform who die overseas to their families. So Florida's always provided uh, a death benefit to the spouses and children of police officers and firefighters if they die in the line of service where your spouse and children can go to a state university for free and you'll get a financial stipend. But we didn't do the same thing for men and women in the military. So I was very, like I said, fortunate to be allowed to run that bill last year uh, to provide uh, you know, that same service to a lot of the families in Pensacola come from the military. We're a high military per capita area. We have several really incredible bases. We're the home to the Blue Angels. I get to see them practice every week. Um, so I would say that's one legislative direct benefit. 
you know, and then obviously always it's, it's fighting for the funds to make sure their infrastructure is as good as possible, you know, roads, bridges, healthcare, uh, reimbursement rates for the, the, the organizations that provide medical services to different community, different subsets of our community. You know, it's, it's, you're always fighting for the funds to make sure everyone is getting the support they need and deserve. We'd like to end our show with a little fun by asking all our guests the same seven questions. What would people be surprised to know about you? So I mentioned I was a cheerleader, that I'm half Jamaican, and I have cerebral palsy, um, which are the usually the three more interesting facts about me. I've also mentioned that I'm a big fan of rap. Um, I'm a pretty open book. <laughs> and uh, as a as a, a 30 year old uh, on the younger side of the legislature, you can you probably go on social media, and um, I'm pretty accessible. Um, man, aside from that, there's not much else not much else I can really say right now. When you have guests in town, where is your favorite place to take them? So it's not a specific place, but I love telling, taking them to Palafox Street, which is Main Street, downtown Pensacola. Um, like I said, Pensacola is a very old town. Uh, you know, we, we go back hundreds of years. And Palafox has restaurants and, and coffee shops and bars. And uh, it's just so beautiful. And I love showing it off because we really do just have, I mean, the state of Florida was accepted as a state from the Spanish in my district. Um, Andrew Jackson the, accepted the, the state of Florida from Spain in the shadow of where my district office is. So, you know, showing the, the history of Pensacola is always a lot of fun. What is the name of a book you recently read that you could not put down or the name of a show you enjoyed binge watching? So I recently read a book. I'm on the criminal justice subcommittee and I was, uh, you know, uh, Chair Sprouse, Chris Sprouse is a big, uh, you know, criminal justice expert. He's got a passion for the subject. And he uh, told me to read a book called Locked In, um, which is probably one of the more intellectually honest books about our prison population and, you know, how uh, the United States especially is, has, um, you know, developed what a lot of people say is an issue with mass incarceration. Reading that book was definitely enlightening. It's got a lot of data in it, but you know, talking about the distinction between violent offenders, repeat offenders, and, and nonviolent offenders, and actually seeing, um, you know, why people actually go to prison, which is a lot more reasonable than I think a lot of people think. You know, people aren't you know walking the street with a dime bag of weed and going to prison for ten years. Uh, it was it was definitely very helpful for me to gain more perspective. Among your close family and friends, what are you best known for? I would probably say I'm the most impulsive. Um, my my wife and my my buddy Walker like telling the joke that we were at dinner one night and it was one of the first cold nights in Pensacola and I just got this wild hair that we needed to have a, a bonfire that night so I actually got up from dinner and went home to actually get the fire ready so when they were done with dinner and we would have all our friends over uh, to our house and the and the bonfire would be going so I'm I'm, I'm I wouldn't say I'm you know shoot first, ask questions later necessarily. But once I decide something's the right thing to do, I definitely just, just go at it full force. If you have a nickname, who gave it to you? Oh man, it's a terrible nickname and I hate it. Uh, it's just, it's silly. Um, when you go to the University of Florida, you get assigned an email and my first name is actually Robert. So my email was R Alex Andrade. And for whatever reason, my mother-in-law thought that my nickname was Ralex because I guess she didn't realize that my first name was Robert. And it just stuck. And it's, um, you know, I hate being called Ralex, and, uh, but people like doing it to get my goat. And then the, the other one actually uh, came from Brad Drake, Chair Brad Drake, um, uh, last session. Oh, you are calling him out right now. <laughs> my, name, my name is not the, the easiest to pronounce. And I'm actually, you know, especially the first session as an unknown, you know, new state rep, uh, committee staff had difficulty pronouncing my name when they called roll. So Andrade would become Adandi, Andrade, Andrade, and uh, uh, to haze you on your first bill. When you bring your first bill up in committee, uh, you'll get hazed as a new rep. And uh, Chair Drake uh, decided throughout my first bill presentation as committee to address me by a different version of my last name uh, the entire time, you know, Adandi and so on. And on my way out the door, he said, thank you, Representative Android. Uh, and that one also stuck. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of other representatives who like calling me Representative Android when they see me. If you knew you could not fail, what would you attempt? Mm. Do you watch The Office ever? 
Love that show. Okay. Uh, do you remember when, when they asked Creed the same question about what's his biggest dream? Just perform the perfect cartwheel? If not, so if not, it's one, it's one of my favorite scenes because it's just like this sweet, weird, sincere moment for this bizarre character named Creed. He just wanted to execute the perfect cartwheel. And that was that was his live stream. I probably, you know, as a cheerleader, I never got to do a back tuck and, in, in, you know, a, just a standing backflip uh, at a game because they never trusted me to. So I'd probably just try and do a backflip. What are the top three things you love about living in Florida? Uh, the weather, uh, the people and the no state income tax. Rep, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. For more information on our show, please visit us on our website, thefloridaville.com. Be sure to like our Facebook page so that you can learn more about upcoming episodes. We would love to hear your feedback and ideas for future episodes, so be sure to email us. Our email address is feedback at thefloridaville.com. Thank you for listening.